I'm an American composer, not a jazz composer. It never occurred to me. My whole life, I've never thought of myself as a jazz composer. I've always been in this weird gray area where, um, where jazz musicians are the only people who don't consider me a jazz musician. Everybody else does. You do realize you're on jazz night, right? But hey, we're open-minded. I'm Christian McBride, and for this episode, we're at Seattle's Earshot Jazz Festival. Seattle is where Wayne Horvitz has been making music since he left New York City in 1988. I had hitchhiked and hiked around, around here a lot when I was both a teenager and in college, and I just loved the area. I actually didn't know much about Seattle, it was more the, the area, but I knew it was, a, it was you know, a great city. And when I got here, I mean, I just had no idea how interesting the music scene was going to turn out to be. The whole grunge thing had just started at that time, and it brought a lot of attention to Seattle, but also a lot of great energy, particularly uh, the guys in Pearl Jam. They have a great studio we use all the time. You know, they may have been rock stars, but they're really supportive of what we were doing, helpful. You know, it was, it was a real community. It wasn't long until Wayne became a musical force in Seattle himself. He leads a bunch of bands, teaches at Cornish College of the Arts, and owns and operates the Royal Room, which has become a hub for Seattle musicians. He plays for festivals and concert halls and at community centers on the outskirts of town. There's this ecology in Seattle around jazz. If there is a Seattle sound, now it reflects a lot of Wayne Horvitz's influence and his presence here. John Gilbreth often features Wayne Horvitz at the Earshot Jazz Festival. John's been a fan since he first heard Wayne's music many years ago. I was knocked out by it. I was like, you know, boom. Like, what in the hell? Wayne's newest project is inspired by the poetry of Seattle native Richard Hugo. His ensemble played that music at Cornish College of the Arts.
Each song in this project is based on a specific line in the poetry of the late Richard Hugo. Here's footage of the man himself. Oh, never fear, for we will cheer it. West Seattle day, ra ra ra. So, what does it take to turn a poem into jazz? Hugo's poems are are musical, and they have a kind of flow that's musical. And I just suddenly started to read the poems, and I was just hooked. Some places are forever afternoon. Across the road and a short field, there is the river split and yellow, and this far down, affected by the tide. Well, the whole thing about Hugo is, is people always talk about place in, in his writing. He had something called triggering, and he has a book called The Triggering Town. I don't really know very much about these subjects that seem to start the poems. That is to say, what, I, what seems to happen is I internalize the town, convert it to the town the poem needs, and then simply appropriate it to the poem. He would go stop someplace, He'd go for a drive, he'd go to a bar, he'd go to a town. In fact, sometimes he'd write the poem and the people in the towns would be upset because they were like, well, that's not our town. But that wasn't his point. He might have only been there for three hours. The point is, it was his catalyst. It, it may help to not know very much about the town because the less you know about the town, the more you can add. The more you mo know about the town, the more you may have to subtract. And subtraction is always more difficult than addition, even when you're a little kid in grammar <laughs> school. They, right. uh, so. Uh, it, the, the thing is, is, is to, uh, I, I think, to, to make it the town that the poem needs, then you can fill. He had the town, I had the poem. I mean, the poem was, was the trigger for my music. It was simple as that. Sometimes it was just like the poem was there on the piano and I got an idea. Sometimes I just read the poem over and over again and you know, a week later it came to me. So on a couple of cases I started to write a piece of music and I thought, oh, that's that poem. Degrees of Grey in Phillipsburg is the poem people consider Hugo's greatest. Hugo visited Phillipsburg for just a few hours. By the following morning he had already written the poem. This footage was shot that same day as part of a documentary about his life. You even recognize the buildings and characters in his poetry. You might come here Sunday on a whim, say your life broke down, the last good kiss you had was years ago. You walk these streets... Not only do I love that poem, but I've known that it's a really important Hugo poem in a lot of people's opinion. So I decided to write a kind of much more episodic piece. Most of the pieces kind of have one feeling, and I wanted to get all of that in there. Isn't this your life, that ancient kiss, still burning out your eyes. Isn't this It's sad, it's so wrenching, accurate. isn't it? it kind of tears you up a little bit. And I think it's sort of like contained by this little narrative that anchors you on either side and then the middle is just like, you know, the, the sorrow in that town and then it kind of parks back at the end, contained. The car that brought you here still runs. The money you buy lunch with, no matter where it's mined, is silver. And the girl who serves you food is slender, slender and, and her, her red, red hair, hair lights, lights the wall. The
boy, did he nail it. He has Hugo, because that music is so velvety and mustard colored and amberish. I don't know how else to describe it. And then it's sort of, you know, just when you think it's getting a little nostalgic or sentimental, it just veers away back into real life. So it's got that gritty thing that just pulls at your heart, just pulls at it. Wayne Horvitz digs Richard Hugo's later poetry, which he wrote after moving to Montana to become a professor. So Wayne went to Montana to retrace Hugo's steps. He brought his daughter, who took these photos. One photo even became Wayne's album cover. We just drove around. We met friends of Hugo's, people that had known him, but we also just rolled into town and just checked it out. And, you know, she was over 21, so we could go into bars. And, um, you know, and, and we hung out, and it was great. One stop was a particular bar in Missoula made famous by Hugo's poem, The Milltown Union Bar. One thing I like about Montana is that people there, many of them feel the way I do about bars. They think of certain bars as being home. Hugo felt more comfortable at Milltown Bar than anywhere on campus. He always felt like a bait fisherman and a guy who hung out on bar stools. In fact, the English department at the University of Montana for Hugo's office number, they had the Milltown Bar. So people would call up to make an office hours appointment and they'd get the bartender. And I think students thought that that was his secretary or something, and then they'd hand the phone to Hugo. Some of Hugo's best poetry was about overlooked places, like the Milltown Bar and West Marginal Way in Seattle. This is where Hugo wrote his famous line, Some Places Are Forever Afternoon, which Wayne took as the title of his album.
You can hear more music on our radio show. Check your local listings or visit npr.org slash jazzman. I'm Christian McBride, and thanks for watching.